So we now continue with the second chapter in this course. The second chapter is mean convergence and some applications to PDEs. So what is mean convergence? Mean convergence means convergence in L2 norm. Remember in the very first chapter we talked about the different modes of convergence of a Fourier series. We talked about pointwise convergence, we talked about mean convergence, we talked about Cesaro convergence. Cesaro convergence will be taken up in the next chapter. The first chapter concerns pointwise convergence. Now we talk about mean convergence. So first we shall discuss what is convergence in mean. We shall introduce the appropriate function spaces and cover the requisite preliminaries. We shall discuss two applications of the Parseval formula. The most important formula that we shall derive in this chapter is the Parseval formula. As an application of the Parseval formula, we shall give Hurwitz's proof of a classical result in geometry called the isoperimetric theorem. We shall prove the maximum modulus theorem in complex analysis via Parseval formula. Then we will take up Abel summability and the Poisson kernel and we shall give some applications to solving the Laplace's equation on a disk and the heat equation. So this is the theme of the second chapter. So let us begin. So the second mode of convergence we talked about is convergence in mean. We need to re recall some rudiments of Lebesgue theory theory of Lebesgue integration. If you are not familiar with Lebesgue integrals, you can pick up any book on real analysis. My favorite book is Royden, Real Analysis. There is another beautiful book, Goffman and Pedrick, a first course in functional analysis. A beautiful book. Somewhere in the future slide, the exact reference is given to you. So let i be an interval on the real line and p be a real number between 1 and infinity where I include 1 and I exclude infinity and Lp of i, Lp of i is a set of all measurable functions on i such that the integral mod fx to the power p dx is less than infinity. There is a pth power of the modulus of f is integrable over i. And then the norm, the LP norm is defined to be the integral over i, the pth power of mod ft, the whole thing to the power 1 by p. So you must have seen these things in your real analysis courses. This is the LP norm. This is the, this thing that you see is the LP norm of f. With respect to this LP norm, Lp of i is a Banach space. Of course, we have to show that if f satisfies this integrability condition and if g also satisfies this integrability condition, then f plus g will also satisfy this condition. In other words, first we have to prove that Lp of i is a vector space, complex vector space. And then we have to show that this is a norm. The triangle inequality is the one that's going to be non-trivial. After that, you have to show that with respect to this norm, it's a complete normed linear space. Every Cauchy sequence converges. That's what we are required to show. This is done in standard courses on measure theory. This is called the Ries-Fisher theorem that Lp of i is a Banach space. That's a Ries-Fisher theorem. You might also wonder why is it that I've excluded p over here we also have the notion of L infinity of i, but the definition is slightly different. We won't use L infinity of i in this course, and so when we need it, at that stage of the game, we'll define it. The only LP spaces that we are going to use in this particular chapter is when p equal to L2 of i is what we are going to be concerned with in this particular chapter. 
and secondly the interval in question is going to be minus pi pi so you may right away restrict yourself to l2 of minus pi pi if you like so let us continue with the discussion but with p equal to 2 so for p equal to 2 what is the norm the l2 norm is norm g equals integral a to b mod g t squared dt the whole thing to the power half of course the integral may be plus infinity in which case the function is not in l2 for example if i take g of x equal to 1 upon root x 1 upon root x is integrable on 0 to 1 integral mod gx dx is finite for gx equal to 1 upon root x but square it mod gx squared is 1 upon x can you integrate 1 upon x from 0 to 1 no it becomes plus infinity so this 2.1 becomes plus infinity for this particular choice of gx so gx is an example of a function in l1 of 0 1 but it is not in l2 of 0 1 so for example l1 of 0 1 and l2 of 0 1 are different spaces they are not equal but l2 of ab is going to be contained in l1 of ab a and b are finite real numbers in particular every l2 function from minus pi to pi is also an l1 function so if i take a function in l2 of minus pi pi i can compute its fourier coefficients and i can write down its fourier series now the question is that will this fourier series converge to f in l2 surprisingly the answer is yes if a function f is in l2 then obviously it is also in l1 the fourier coefficients are defined the fourier series are defined and the fourier series converges to f in l2 the theory is nice and elegant by the way this inclusion is an exercise for you using the cauchy schwarz inequality use the cauchy schwarz inequality and prove this inclusion l2 of ab is contained in l1 of ab where a and b are finite real numbers so we want to study the convergence or the partial sums of the fourier expansion with respect to l2 norm so let us now look at some preliminaries on l2 so the space of functions g from ab to r for which the integral 2.1 is finite integral mod gt squared dt that should be finite that is denoted by l2 of ab it's a vector space it is evident that if f is in l2 and i multiply f by a constant then the then cf will also be in l2 what is not immediately clear is if f is in l2 and g is in l2 then f plus g is also in l2 we have to show that fx plus gx mod squared has finite integral so let us let us just expand it mod fx squared plus mod gx squared plus 2 times mod fx mod gx i'm going to get less than or equal to because i applied the triangle inequality and then apply the elementary inequality to ab less than or equal to a squared plus b squared we get mod fx squared plus mod gx squared plus mod fx squared plus mod gx squared less than or equal to 2 times mod fx squared plus mod gx squared integral of mod fx squared is finite integral of mod gx squared is finite therefore integral of mod fx plus gx the whole squared is also finite so f plus g is also square integrable if f and g are square integrable so certainly l2 of ab is a vector space we have to show triangle inequality triangle inequality is usually proved using the cauchy schwarz inequality i'll leave it to you or consult any of your favorite books on real analysis now let us discuss completeness of l2 the completeness of l2 the space l2 of ab endowed with the l2 norm is complete 
L2 of AB is Cauchy complete with respect to the norm 2.1. What is the norm 2.1? Integral mod gt squared dt the whole thing to the power half. What does the last clause mean? Cauchy complete mean? It means if gn is a sequence of functions such that norm gn minus gm goes to 0 as m n go to infinity, then there is a g in L2 of AB such that the sequence gn converges to g with respect to the L2 norm. We shall not prove this theorem 16 here. It is standard in real analysis courses. For example, you can see the book of Goffman and Pedrick, functional analysis. Okay. What is the problem with continuous functions? Why do we have to work with Lebesgue integrable functions? Why can't we work simply with continuous functions? Suppose if you take a continuous function on a closed bounded interval, it is surely integrable, its square is integrable, so what's the problem? Why not just work with C of AB? So C of AB is a subset of L2 of AB and I can again endow C of AB with the same norm 2.1 namely integral mod gt squared dt square root. But the problem is that C of AB is not going to be complete. One can find a sequence gn of continuous functions such that norm gn minus gm goes to 0 as mn goes to infinity but there is no continuous function g such that gn converges to g. This, there is a L2 function g such that gn minus g goes to 0 but that L2 function may not be continuous. So Cauchy sequences may not converge if I restrict myself to continuous functions only. Cauchy completeness is very important. It's essential for many important existence results in analysis. So we must insist on Cauchy completeness. It is exactly to ensure Cauchy completeness that we need to work with Lebesgue integrable functions, not simply continuous functions. L2 of AB has one more important feature. It's a inner product space. What is the inner product of F and G? The inner product of F and G is integral from A to B, FT, GT, DT, equation 2.2, the displayed equation in the slide. Here we are assuming that F and G are real valued. What happens if F and G are complex valued in this formula 2.2, we must make a small modification. What is the mod modification? We must put a bar on this function g, where the bar signifies complex conjugation. Okay. Now when f and g are equal, we get norm g squared is the inner product of g with itself. So it is an inner product space. As it always happens with an inner product space, there are certain obvious and pleasant consequences. The parallelogram law, norm f plus g squared plus norm f minus g squared is twice norm f squared plus twice norm g squared. The familiar parallelogram law. And two elements f and g in L2 are said to be orthogonal if the inner product of f and g is 0, that is if the integral 2.2 vanishes, of course if g is complex you must put a bar. Third, the triangle inequality norm f plus g less than or equal to norm f plus norm g. Fourth is an exercise, take L2 of minus pi pi, take L2 of minus pi pi. 1 sin x cos x sin 2x cos 2x dot 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 they are all in L2 of minus pi pi. They are mutually orthogonal to each other. So it is an orthogonal system. They are pairwise orthogonal. Any two of them are orthogonal. That is an elementary exercise. You just have to compute the integral. Now let us come to another important example. Look at equation 2.3. Take x squared minus 1 to the power n, n equal to 0, 1, 2, 3. When n is 0, it is simply the constant function 1. If n is 1, 2, 3, etc., 
this is a polynomial of degree 2n and this polynomial of degree 2n I am differentiating how many times n times I am going to get a polynomial of what degree polynomial of degree exactly n you divide this polynomial by 1 upon 2 to the power n n factorial and this is a normalization and with this normalization this polynomial is called the nth Legendre polynomial Legendre polynomial prove that these Legendre polynomials are pairwise orthogonal in L2 of minus 1 1 this Legendre polynomial is a system of orthogonal polynomials. This 1 upon 2 to the power n n factorial has been chosen in such a way that pn of 1 becomes 1. If n is odd, pnx is an odd function. If n is even, pnx is an even function. Easy to check. Now the next problem is a beautiful ex exercise in Rolle's theorem. The polynomial pnx has n distinct real roots in minus 1 1 this minus 1 1 is a fundamental interval in this fundamental interval this nth Legendre polynomial has n distinct roots these roots of the Legendre polynomial are extremely important in numerical analysis in numerical quadrature called Gaussian quadrature there are many places where this Gaussian quadrature is discussed. My favorite is S. Chandrasekhar, Radiative Transfer, Doer Publication, New York, 1960. I'm a great fan of Chandrasekhar's writings. They're charming. His writings are always delightful. So I would recommend S. Chandrasekhar. You can read any book on numerical analysis and you will be able to find some discussion on Gaussian quadrature and how the zeros of the Legendre polynomial play a role there. The Legendre polynomials have many other properties. For example, in linear algebra, you are familiar with the Gram-Schmidt's process. Take an inner product space, take a vector space V with an inner product, take a bunch of vectors V1, V2, V3, etc. and subject it to the Gram-Schmidt's process. If you take a linearly independent set of vectors, I'm going to get an orthonormal system out of that. Now let us do the following. Take L2 of minus 1, 1. Take L2 of minus 1, 1. It's a vector space. 1, x, x squared, x cubed, the monomials. They are linearly independent. And they are all in L2. Subject it to the Gram-Schmidt's process. What happens? What comes out of the Gram-Schmidt's process? The Legendre polynomials. So the Legendre polynomials can be studied from a variety of different perspectives. There are many other types of orthonormal, orthogonal systems of polynomials. Such as Chebyshev's polynomials, the Hermite polynomials, the Laguerre polynomials. You will see more information on this in this link that I provided to you in my home page. Look at the notes for this course MA207 and you will find a lot more uh, information on Legendre polynomials as well as other systems of orthogonal polynomials. Then comes least square approximations. A trigonometric polynomial. What is a trigonometric polynomial? A trigonometric polynomial of degree at most n is simply a linear combination alpha naught plus summation j from 1 to capital N alpha j cos jx plus beta j sin jx. This is called a trigonometric polynomial of degree at most n. Of course, if alpha n or beta n, one of them at least is non-zero, then I will say that it's a trigonometric polynomial of degree exactly n. I say at most n because either it may happen that alpha n may be zero and beta n may be zero and, and this sum simply goes from one to n minus one. 
Suppose if f is in L2 of minus pi pi, then as I said, I can calculate the Fourier series for f and I can do the partial sums of the Fourier series. And these partial sums are examples of trigonometric polynomials. So the nth partial sum Sn fx is a trigonometric polynomial of degree at most n. Now what we do is the following. We take, a, we take two trigonometric polynomials of degree at most n. One of them is Sn fx and the other one is a general Qnx. And I find out these norms. That means if I try to approximate f of x by a trigonometric polynomial of degree at most n, one such approximant, one such possible approximation is the nth partial sum Sn fx. And you compare the error over here with the error caused by choosing any other trigonometric polynomial of degree at most n. The remarkable thing is that of all possible trigonometric polynomials of degree at most n, if I select Sn fx, then the error will be the least. This is why it is called the least square approximation. So the theorem says that Sn fx is the best approximation among all trigonometric polynomials of degree at most n. It's called the least square approximation. The proof is very easy as a matter of fact. So that theorem has been stated very clearly here. f belongs to L2 of minus pi pi and Qnx is a trigonometric polynomial of degree at most n. Then norm fx minus Sn fx is less than or equal to norm fx minus Qnx. Equality holds if and only if Qnx equal to Sn fx. Let us look at the trivial equation fx minus qnx. Add and subtract, add and subtract sn. So fx minus sn fx plus sn fx minus qnx. This difference sn fx minus qnx, I am simply calling it rnx. Obviously, rnx is a trigonometric polynomial of degree at most n. We shall prove that fx minus snx, this first piece, is orthogonal to 1 sin x cos x da 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 sin nx cos nx. If it is orthogonal to each of these, then it will be orthogonal to linear combinations of these. In other words, this will be orthogonal to every trigonometric polynomial of degree at most n. In particular, it will be orthogonal to rnx. Let us prove that. Well, cos jx is orthogonal to 1 sin kx cos kx when k not equal to j. That is the first observation. That is a trivial observation. Cos jx is orthogonal to 1. It is orthogonal to sin kx as well as cos kx k not equal to j. So, when I take fx minus sn fx and multiply it with cos jx, what is it going to be? It is going to be fx times cos jx integral, but that is pi times aj from the definition of Fourier coefficient minus integral minus pi to pi sn fx cos jx. But the nth partial sum contains all sorts of terms, but they will all be orthogonal to cos jx except the jth term. What is the jth term? Aj cos jx. That is the only thing that will survive in this integral. And so what you get is Aj cos squared jx. The Aj comes out of the integral. The cos squared jx you have to integrate. Multiply and divide by 2. 2 cos squared jx is 1 plus cos 2jx. The integral of cos 2gx from minus pi to pi is 0, we simply get 0. So fx minus sn fx is orthogonal to cos jx for every j from 1 to n 
and so it is going to be orthogonal to linear combination of 1 cos x cos 2x da 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 cos nx sin x sin 2x sin nx so it is orthogonal to rnx and so the, by the Pythagorean identity we will get norm fx minus qn x squared equal to norm fx minus snx squared plus norm rnx squared. What is the Pythagorean law? If two vectors in a vector space, if u and v are two vectors in a vector space and if they are orthogonal then norm u squared plus norm v squared is norm u plus v the whole squared because fx minus snx is orthogonal to rnx norm of fn fx minus snx squared plus norm rnx squared is the, is the same as the norm or the sum the sum is exactly fx minus qnx squared all right so we see at once that norm fx minus qnx larger than or equal to norm fx minus snx why because i'm knocking off this term non negative term so i'm going to get an inequality so that's a first important observation and when will equality hold this inequality will be equality if and only if rnx is 0 rnx is 0 if and only if qnx equal to sn snfx and so the least square approximation has been established so now what we want to do is that we want to deduce some corollaries from this least square approximations and the first corollary will be the Bessel's inequality and from Bessel's inequality we are going to get another relation called the Parseval formula. The Parseval formula will tell you that if a0, an, bn's are the Fourier coefficients of an L2 function then equality will hold. Of course you will ask why not directly prove the Parseval formula why are we proving the inequality first and then proving equality later this will be a stepping stone for proving the Parseval formula that's why we are proving this inequality first the Bessel's inequality comes first and we're going to use the Bessel's inequality to prove the Parseval's formula the least square approximation that we have proved will play a crucial role in establishing the Parseval formula we'll continue this in the next capsule I think it's a good place to stop here. Thank you very much.